Good evening and welcome to the 16th Shandy Rudolph Memorial Evening. I'm Marcella Schulach and it is my tremendous honor to direct the Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing that was created by Shandy herself and later endowed through the generosity of her family. And Hedda, thank you for being here and for bringing your family. Um, you'll meet um, Hedda's sister, Lydia Weissman, in a little while, who you'll hear from after I've spoken. And Hedda, af over 16 years ago, your daughter, Shandy, created this graduate program in creative writing with the vision and the collaboration of Michael Kramer, who developed a really innovative Jewish arts program seminar. Linda Ziskwit, who opened up the poetry track, Alan Hoffman, who opened up the fiction track, and with that and a little bit of duct tape, they've held it together, and we've all held it together for quite a while. In the ensuing years, we've added literary nonfiction and we've added literary translation. So we now have four tracks, and so we've doubled in size and capacity. Our outside we have many outside visiting writers that make our miracles possible. And this year, they have been Yael HaKohen. In the past, Jane Medved, who's also a graduate of the program, and Ayelet Sabari have taught. And Ayelet will be teaching again. You heard her earlier today. Um, our graduates have been outstanding. And we just had a graduate reading um, that I know several of you heard. I'm just going to list two of the most recent. Marva Zohar published all five versions of her thesis in one long book only months ago, and she was lauded by the Israeli critic Eli Hirsch as the poet who will set the stage for the next generation of Israeli poetry, and who'll stand out on that stage for the next decade. Others, such as Joanna Hen, who's been here today and yesterday, have turned to translation as Joanna Hunt has pointed out yesterday in her workshop, translating, reading, and writing are all inseparable and necessary. She's translated Mer Shalev and our Sunday night guest, Rana Verben. Those are just two of the most recent of 20 books, over 20 books in 16 years by alumni that this program has uh, graduated. In addition, you witnessed the Illinois Review retrospective reading today and this internationally acclaimed journal, which received five-star ratings from the Review Review, among others, was founded by alumni and continues to be run by them. Hedda, your generosity also inspired four literature prizes. Yesterday marked the 12th Andrea Mariah Memorial Poetry Prize, sponsored by Andy's sister, Wendy Sandler, and the 10th Annual Dave Grieber Nonfiction Award for Social Justice, sponsored by Shirley Dunn. This year, we've added two awards the Sandy Nairn Prize for Literary Translation, sponsored by Evan Fallenberg, and um, the Bar Segui Prize in Fiction, sponsored by Bar's grandparents, Professor Emeritus Anthony and Denise Joseph. These prizes were awarded yesterday, accompanied by the violin of the internationally unknown musician, known, not unknown, Daniel Hoffman. <laughs> it's hard being short, because I can't really do that. OK. I'm particularly pleased that Shandy's greatness of spirit continues on in our program and is evidenced by the astonishing generosity and competence of our graduate students, without whom this program would not be possible. And I know you've all noticed and commented today on Vivian Lesoric, Cohen Lesoric, Yoni Hammer Kasoy, Sarah Sasson, and Michael Benheim, who have done everything from ferry around people in their private cars, taking home flowers, setting up book tables, passing around microphones, and figuring out technology. I want to give a very special thanks to Evan Fallenberg, who only hours, with only hours notice, wrote a beautiful introduction that you heard on Sunday night and moderated my panel while I recovered from some strange and mysterious health issue. I really am happy that it was over tonight so I can enjoy that amazing food. <laughs> it's all okay now. But it was very embarrassing and frustrating not to be there with you on Sunday. And so, Hedda, I hope you can see what a beautiful and powerful community of care your generous gift has made possible. The thoughtfulness and devotion of, to literature that your daughter's dream and efforts and your financial gift, but most of all, your continued presence among us has really inspired us. 
And since I was not here on Sunday, I want now to touch upon the theme of this year's conference, which is life writing and the writing life. And the title was inspired by Ilana Bloomberg's exemplary writing and scholarship. Now, you might be wondering what life writing is, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of it. You've seen all of it this week because all of the speakers that we had engage in life writing. It encompasses all the varieties of personal narrative and testimony, autobiography, biography, fictional autobiography, autobiographical fiction, poetry, all of that stuff, essay. All the writers we've heard from over the last three days engage in it, but what distinguished their writing, or what distinguishes life writing in general, is that it has an outward facing as well as an introspective purpose. In other words, it isn't just meant for the writer to sort out their life or their thoughts, and it isn't just meant for the reader to read it and think, wow, that lady has a wild life. It is, from the beginning, writing that acknowledges the possibility of a reader while conveying a, conveying a sense of intimacy. And what does that mean? It means that the works were written for a reader, an interlocutor, a listener, these works are structurally incomplete without you, reader. You can say that all work is incomplete without a reader, but life writing creates a character for you, reader, or you, the jury, or you, the yearned for beloved. In fact, here's a secret. We don't really read and reread work because it was written by important people or people who know important people or beautiful people or famous people. We may buy those books, they're in the airport bookstores for that purpose, but we read and we reread and we laugh and we cry and we feel at home in books because we as readers find a space for ourselves in them. We feel that the writer understands us and speaks to us and that the writer needs us. In the South, and I'm gonna say this because Beth Ann Finley is also from the South, we are told, and I'm sure you've heard this, Beth, Beth Ann, beautiful people are those that, that other people notice, but charming, powerful people with integrity are those who notice other people. Life writing is writing that notices other people. This week we've heard from some of the most vibrant life writers um, we have today. Beth Ann Fennelly, who has coined the micro-memoir to convey the intimacy and love of a 20-plus year marriage in her book, Heating and Cooling. Rana Verbin, who coined the term auto-reality to describe Tel Aviv life in the 1980s through the 2000s in Life is Good. Ariella Friedman, who read from her powerful biography of polyglot labor activist, feminist, Leah Robach of Montreal. And tonight you'll hear from Kim Eklund. Are you gonna be reading from Speak Silence? Good, I was hoping so. Who has written a powerful work of fiction based on real testimony from the Bosnian War. And these are the tribunals in The Hague. These writers have created such powerful works because they focus on the reader, the listener, to connect us to the events of the lives of others, to create intimacy, immediacy, empathy, and community. These attributes kept us alive during the period of COVID when we were all closed inside of Zoom boxes, and they are abundant in the legacy of Shandy Rudolph and in all truly great literature. I define great literature as that which allows us to see the humanity and the beauty in others. And I am humbled to be among the stewards of literature and of this program. And without further ado, I'll turn this over to Michael Kramer, who'll give a Dvar Torah. Uh, evening. Hedda, family, friends, colleagues. Um, I'm going to begin um, before the Dvar Torah. I'm going to begin with a Talmudic thank you, and then the Dvar Torah. Uh, those of you who follow or know about the uh, Dafyomi program, anybody know about that? Uh, studying a page of Talmud a day, know that sometimes the discussion about arcane matters can be dizzying. Uh, lately, they've been about androgynes and eunuchs, so it's been strange. But several weeks ago, in a digression from the main topic of the tractate, the rabbis considered a verse from Ecclesiastes that spoke to me directly, 
and very clearly. Baboker zra et zarecha ula erev al tenach yadecha. In the morning sow your seed, and the evening do not withhold your hand. The rabbis seem to agree that the verse is not about agriculture, but needs to be understood allegorically. Uh, and they agree as well that it needs to be understood allegorically about old age. It's getting personal now. In classic Talmudic fashion, however, they disagree about how it's about old age. Rabbi Yehoshua says it means that if a, if a man he, uh, if a man married a woman in his youth, he should marry another woman in his old age. So I asked my wife, <laughs> okay, uh, you know how that turned out. Um, Rabbi Yoshua continues, if he had children in his youth, he should have more children in his old age. So I asked my wife about that. And you know how that turned out. Um, then Rabbi Akiva gives his opinion. Um, and he says, if one studied Torah in his youth, he should study more Torah in his old age. No problem. Okay, done keeping the gray cells in relatively good condition. And then Rabbi Akiva continues, if he had students in his youth, he should have additional students in his old age. So, first, I want you to know how tremendously grateful I am to my colleagues for allowing this old man to continue to teach past his retirement and to participate in this conference. I do not take it for granted, and I appreciate it more than you can imagine. Thank you. Second, though I am grateful for all my students, I am particularly grateful for the creative writing students in the William Solomon, Solomon Jewish Art Seminar, the course I inherited from Shandy, her parting gift to me. In it, we consider the Jewish literary tradition from the Bible to contemporary writers, from King David to Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan, uh, what it means to write within a tradition, to engage creatively with the texts that came before, to see the tradition or traditions as a resource, that's Shandy's word, uh, as a rich, inexhaustible mine that has inspired, confused, angered, and engaged for millennia. Now the Dvar Torah. This past Shabbat, we began to read the Book of Numbers, Sefer Bamidbar in Hebrew, sometimes it's called Sefer Hapkudim, the Book of Numbers, which follows Moses and the children of Israel to the plains of Moab on the east bank of the Jordan River, a period of 38 plus years. It's called Numbers because it begins with a census and is replete with lists, how they would march, how they would camp. There are lists and lists of sacrifices, and it ends with a survey of tribal borders in anticipation of their entry into the Promised Land. To be sure, there are also juicy narratives, and almost all of them are negative. The people complain about the menu, Korach leads a rebellion against Moses' leadership. The spies return after scouting out Canaan, badmouth the country, and the people refuse to continue on. There's whoring with the Moabite women. Miriam and Aaron slander their brother Moses, complaint after complaint, murmuring after murmuring. We were better off in Egypt. Okay. And after each episode, violent expressions of God's wrath. Almost everyone who was counted in the opening census is dead before the end. It's not a pretty picture. It's a very strange literary structure, which makes you wonder about the text's narrative strategy. And this is the sort of this, uh, question I would ask the students in the Jewish Arts Seminar. Now, jumping ahead from ancient times to the 12th century, Rashi, the quintessential exegete, opens his commentary on this book by explaining why it opens with a census. It was a display, he writes, of the Lord's affection for his people. 
a peculiar idea to plant in the reader's head. Rashi wants to frame the book of numbers, the book of murmurings and rebellions and catastrophes, as a love story. Okay. Now let's jump back again about two millennia to the book of Hosea, one of the oldest and certainly one of the strangest of the prophetic books. Anybody know Hosea? Okay, so you know. It begins this way. When the Lord spoke at first with Hosea, the Lord said unto Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry. For the land doth commit great harlotry, departing from the Lord. And Hosea obeys. Okay. Now, many of the commentaries read this allegorically. It's not, he didn't really go and take a prostitute for his wife, right? Hosea, right? But Rashi says, no, 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 this is real. And he references a midrash that elaborates. So now we jump ahead a few centuries, and a millennia probably, and I paraphrase and summarize the midrash. The Holy One, blessed be he, says to Hosea, the people have sinned. What should I do? This is not in the text. This is in the midrash. God asks uh, Hosea, what should I do? Hosea responds, master of the universe, the entire world is yours. Since Israel has sinned, get rid of them. Exchange them for another people. Okay. This annoys the Holy One, blessed be he, who wanted Hosea to defend the people as Moses did. So the Lord tells Hosea to marry a prostitute and have children with her. Then after he fathers three children, God tells him to divorce her. Hosea complains, master of the universe, I have sons from her. I can't dis dismiss her Dismiss them or divorce her. Ah, says the Lord, your wife is a harlot. You don't even know if the children are really yours. And still you will not forsake them. Yet you tell me to forsake my people, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and choose another? That's the Midrash. Okay. So now I add here that this week's Haftarah, the prophetic reading, the supplemental reading from the prophets, is from the second chapter of Hosea, which ends this way. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Verastich li liolam. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Did Rashi really have all this in mind when he opened his commentary on the book of Numbers by reading God's love for his people into the census? Was he really thinking about the meaning of love and how to tell a love story? I don't know, but that's my version of the story. I suppose there are also moral lessons to be learned from all this, but I'm no preacher, just a teacher. Thanks to my colleagues, still a teacher. And thanks to Shandy, still plumbing the resources of the Jewish literary tradition and challenging students to do the same. Her memory has truly blessed me. May her memory continue to bless us all. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with all of you this evening. It means so much to me and to my family and I've really missed it this past two years. Um, really missed it. I mean, in one sense, it's bittersweet, remembering Shaney, but with each passing year, I must say, the sweetness outweighs the bitterness because of time, time. And to see the flourishing program that she has established here is extraordinarily nurturing to me. And so I feel a closeness to all of you because it's Shandy extending herself further towards all of you. And then towards all the readers who read your, your writing. So it's just like waves, you know, the pebble in, in, in the lake and the waves go around and round. So I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, this year I would like to introduce my 
lovely sister, Lydia Weissman, who just recently made Aliyah and lives in Jerusalem uh, 14 months ago? 16. 16 months ago, okay. And I've been the, the um, happy recipient of her hospitality. And, um, and so um, I, I'm particularly pleased. It's very meaningful. Before I, before I let her speak, I just want to say that when I listened to Beth Ann Fennelly over here, this writer, uh, on the introductory evening on um, Sunday night, she spoke various, um, uh, she's, uh, among her, her, her different remembrances um, were about her sister and her feelings about sisterhood, her, her sister, particularly her sister, and it just, it really uh, resonated with me so much, especially because she's going to be speaking, and I just wish she had been here that night to hear it herself, but since she wasn't, I'm not gonna repeat, of course, it's just that um, I think uh, sisterhood is a complicated relationship uh, for, in various forms for many people, and, um, and it, it's, it's a process that you work through during your life, and so, um, just like other, many other sisterhoods, this is not an easy one, but, but very much um, meaningful, very meaningful and important. And uh, I think uh, over and over, we have become much closer with each other over the years. Because there was a six and a half year difference in age and so on, there, uh, you know, other differences. So. Uh, but anyway, I, I just want to acknowledge that um, to Beth Ann for bringing that up to me. I wasn't going to speak at all, but after you spoke, I felt I had to say something. Uh, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my sister, Lydia Weissman. I just want to say, I'm not going to talk about complicated sisterhood, <laughs> but, uh, but Hedda did talk about the sweetness getting stronger than the, some of the sadness. And I, you know, hello, it's 16 years, sweet 16. So I just thought that that had to be noted. So, okay. Um, so I was, and in many ways feel I still am, Shane D's over the top, totally devoted Gaga aunt. Uh, many of you here were probably lucky enough to have the thrill of either having had or were indeed uh, one of us. You know, the single aunt or uncle who goes absolutely nuts over his or her first niece or nephew. That was me. I suppose I would have been that way initially regardless of the, the teensy specimen that was presented to me. But eventually, once that little one had siblings who were also delightful, and certainly once I was blessed with my own terrific kids, some here, um, it would have been expected that I would moderate and normalize my intense feelings for that first grandchild of my parents. But that's not what happened, because that little girl was Shandy, and she was just born Shandy special, adorable, funny, clever, intuitive, confident, talented, balanced, innovative, a leader, kind, and low-keyed. Of course, she evolved and matured, but it was all there and evident from the start. And then it just became fun to watch her blossom and watch her actualize herself, observe the gifts form into skills, fell as the promise emerged into the reality. Now, I realize there are two groups of people here tonight. I suppose together we form a coalition, and I'm confident this coalition is a stable one. Uh, there is party number one, team number one, who knew Shady, her family, of course, her close friends, both from America and from Israel, her literary colleagues, both from the general community as well as her beloved Barilan staff and students. Each of you, no doubt, have your own Shandy stories that you treasure and share with others that bring forth a smile both on the inside and outside upon recollection. 
So I will not impose mine upon you. Just continue enjoying your own unique memories, whether heartwarming or funny or helpful or more than a little piquant um, and most likely a mixture of all of the above. But then there is Among Us, um, team number two. Uh, since Shandy was Nifter now 16 years ago, it certainly makes sense that many of you here have had no direct encounter with her. Uh, you joined the staff later. You became a student here later. But you keep hearing her name. It's on the bloody stationery. I recall clearly when I was a one-year student here at Barilan, the year following the Six-Day War, as part of my nightly ritual, I would thank the couple whose name was uh, on the donation plaque in my dorm room. I, of course, didn't know them, but I was aware that it was because of the, the generous gift of people like them that I could benefit from the gift of being a student here. Um, so Shandy was generous, however, in a different way. Shandy was generous with her energy, her enthusiasm, her integrity, and her vision. Uh, no, uh, you did not know her directly, but you are living her dream to your benefit and to the honor of her memory. Probably you have heard Shandy's stories, but my guess is in, in another 16 years, and then many more 16 years following, there will no longer be many first-hand storytellers. Just this wonderful institution, which she loved, and we hope will always continue to be a reflection of her goals and ideals. And those will become the new Shandy stories told. How because of this program, you were molded as a writer, a Jew, and a mensch. So guys, team number two, it is totally on you now. So to speak, you've heard the old legend and now make your own. I do feel confident that when you do, even if you do not name her or see the clear thread, you will have inevitably taken in abyssal something of Shandy uh, from this program that so embodies Shandy. Let's say in a sense you become a Pintala Shandy and I promise she'll be giving you one of her sly Shandy smiles, and for some reason that you may not understand in that moment, you will suddenly feel a slight flutter and a warm feeling inside. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, you'll forgive me if I keep my jacket off. Um, I decided it was probably a little bit too much this morning when I got on the bus and the bus driver said to me, Mabruk, I see you're getting married today. <laughs> That's how common jackets are in this country, so I figure I can go without one. Um, thank you for being here. I have to tell you all that I'm, uh, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, I'm a little overwhelmed. It's been, first of all, a two and a half day conference and that's intense. And we have Marcella to thank for that, who did an amazing job pulling all of this together. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's also intense because what we do is intense. It's not just equations, it's, it's deep thinking and talking. And a number of you have come up to me and said, wow, thank you guys for continuing to do this because it keeps us charged, it keeps us going. And when we all go back to our regular lives and then we have this to be able to step, step back into, it's really, really important and extraordinary. And you know, there was um, someone here this, who was here earlier today who was in the first group that came into the Shandy Rudolph program. And she reminded me of something that I'd forgotten and maybe many of you don't know. This was actually the first writing program of any kind in this country. The he first Hebrew program only came to Ben Gurion University several years later. So this was where, and, and she was a Hebrew writer. And so I said to her, what were you doing? here and she said well it was the only program um, and so if I wanted to study creative writing this was I had to do it in English and so that's pretty amazing it's even more amazing when you think about what Shandy created here Shandy and um, I mean she was the, the the person behind it but then with Michael Kramer and, and Linda Ziskwit and Alan Hoffman and, and if I'm forgetting somebody I apologize I wasn't here then um, I'm also humbled because I mean 
Michael's Dvar Torah, it was re really beautiful, Michael, and it, it's a little shocking when you stop to think about the literary tradition that we're part of, and you think all those centuries of people talking to each other through words that they've you know, put on pages and people relating to them century after century. And, and in some ways, even though we're only writing novels and, and things like that, we're, we're very much part of the conversation. That conversation goes on through all of us. And I also, I don't know how many of you were here for the event that took place just before this that was mentioned, but, um, you know, there were a lot of thank yous. Um, uh, by students who were reading. And I have to say, I, t I told a few people, I'm, I'm very good at deflecting that when someone comes up and says, you know, in your workshop, it really meant something to me. And I say, thank you, thank you. And I move on. And I was sitting there listening to these people up here reading the most amazing, devastating words. And I thought, that's what they've been trying to tell me. That's what they've been trying to tell all of us, that because we're here and because we do what we do, they're enabled, and in some way we're part of that process. It's a mystery to me, no matter how hard I work at it, it's still a mystery. And the fact that they can create these beautiful words, I don't know, something just uh, sunk in and I thought, wow, I'm so humbled and lucky to be part of this, to p part of this process, it's, it's fantastic. Um, Right, we're here to talk with Kim Eklund. Kim Eklund, you know what? <laughs> Kim is a good friend, so I, I don't like walk around with her biography in front of my face. And you have it all in, in, in front of you, but I just want to remind you of a few things. Um, Kim is, um, of, we, as, as was mentioned here, we have four genres in the program. Well, well, basically, Kim does all of them. She's a novelist, a poet, a nonfiction writer, and a translator. Uh, she's the whole package, and she's won, I'm not going to do it, she's won a lot of prizes, and they're all deserved. I'm a big fan of hers, a big fan of hers uh, as a writer and as a human being. Um, and... I feel very lucky that we were, be, we were able to bring her from Canada to, to be here with us. And so you will want to read more of her bi biography, but you will absolutely want to read more of her writing after you've met her and, and heard her. And I think that's what we really need to get to. So the way we're going to do this is Kim is going to speak and read. Uh, for a little while, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion, and if you want to ask or say something toward the end, we'll make some time for that as well. Kim Eklund. Thank you, Evan. And I have some thanks of my own, but first of all, I want to thank the family of Shandy. Um, all of your talks were just so beautiful, Michael and Hedda and Lydia. It was really wonderful to hear um, your reflections and, and the beautiful way you express them. So thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, and thank you to the people in the program. So these names have come up, but I have to thank you as well. So Evan and Marcella and Vivian and Kara and um, Elena and uh, Ayelet and uh, all of the work that Hagit did to make all of this possible. So thanks to all who have been involved in the program. So I want to start with a little story tonight too. And um, I'm going to, it's an old Brothers Grimm story. And uh, I'm going to tell you this story and then I'll talk a little bit about my book. In a certain country, there was once great lamentation over a wild boar that laid waste to the farmer's fields, killed the cattle, and ripped up people's bodies with his tusks. The king promised his daughter's hand in marriage to whoever could kill the boar and rid the kingdom of this scourge. Two brothers decided to try. The older brother went into a tavern to gather his courage. But the younger brother, who had a good and simple heart, entered the forest and he met an old man who gave him a spear. The boar ran right into the spear. And the younger brother took the boar back to the tavern to meet his brother. His brother asked him to come in to have a little something to drink before they went back to the castle. As they were crossing the bridge, the older brother let the younger go first, and then he killed him with a blow from behind, and he buried him hastily under the bridge. He took the boar to the king, 
married the daughter. He said that the boar must have ripped up his younger brother's body. Many years later, a shepherd was crossing the bridge, and that shepherd saw a bone poking out from the sand. He decided to make a flute from it, and to his astonishment, when he blew on the bone, it sang a strange song. Friend, thou blowest upon my bone, long have I lain beside the water. My brother slew me for the boar, and took for his wife the king's own daughter. The shepherd was amazed by the singing bone, and he took it to the king, who instantly recognized what the song was about. The skeleton was found and dug up from under the bridge, and the older brother confessed, and he was sewn into a sack and drowned. And the story ends, but the bones of the murdered man were laid to rest in a beautiful tomb in the churchyard. So I think that a part of our life is lived in quest to overcome and uncover the secrets, our own personal secrets, the secrets that are guarded by our families and by our communities. And as we allow our consciousnesses to shift and change and hopefully expand over the course of our lives, there's more space to accept and hold multiple truths. So I want to hold an idea, quite a simple idea, um, at the beginning of this talk. I want to hold the idea that a great truth lives only in the context of other great truths. So for each great truth, there will be other, uh, other great truths around it in order that they can exist. And the novel that I want to talk to you about tonight, Speak Silence, is about trying to bury bones that refuse to be silent. But it is also about the king who recognizes the meaning of the song when he hears it. So Speak Silence, this novel, is the story of Gota. She's a Canadian woman who falls in love with Cosmos. He's originally from Sarajevo. They meet in Paris and they have this wonderful love affair. Uh, but Cosmos disappears and Gota returns to Canada pregnant. They lose touch. She ra raises their daughter, there's war, and finally after the war, Gota says that she wants to go to Sarajevo, see if she can find Cosmos. While she's there, she meets Adina, who happens also to be a friend of Cosmos. And she learns from Adina about the international criminal court trials that are prosecuting war crimes from that region. She can't turn away from this knowledge. She decides to cover it and write about the trials. This is the opening of the book. They're still shooting, said Jacques Payac. I'm going, I said. The borders are open. I run a travel magazine, he said. I'll write a travel piece. About war? About film. When the hell are you going to settle down? Why should I settle down? What are you hoping for? I only want to know, to tell. I had watched the war on television for years. I had watched life in a city under siege. I had seen people from a bread line bleeding on the ground. The cameras pulled back and I saw smoke and fire from apartment towers. My name is Gota Dobson. I saw these images on the same screen that I watched cartoons with my only child. Intolerable shame. To watch an old woman in good leather shoes hurrying over rubble along the edges of buildings. To watch boys and girls playing on tanks. To change the channel. To live in the unattended moment to be where I was not. The war did not abate, and the news remained clear and constant, and the world struggled to rouse itself. To know is not enough. Now, this, the specific trial that I fictionalized in the book is called the Focha trial, and all of the International Criminal Court trials are available online. It's a wonderful international resource. Um, so if you're interested in any of the trials, they are meant to be a world resource, and you can read the full transcripts of the, of the trials and see, actually, recordings of parts of them. Um, the, th the reason I became interested in this, in this specific trial was it meant... Th this trial was, was prosecuting for the first time the crime of rape in war, and while they prosecuted that, what they were doing was they were 
looking at how this crime was not a crime against a single woman, but a crime against humanity, and uh, potentially a constitutive part of genocide. So it was transformative law. This kind of law had never been um, uh, codified uh, until uh, the 1990s. And the, the, the thing that I was very moved by was that this transformed the crime of rape against, war, uh, against women in war from an individual um, uh, crime to a crime against humanity, which means it's a crime against all of us. So to try to contextualize that and to show why it's so important, we have a long tradition of rape and war that dates to Homer, dates to the Iliad. So 760 BC, and uh, when uh, the Greeks have won the war, uh, the, the general Agamemnon says to the soldiers, and this is what is embedded in our consciousness from storytelling, let no man hurry to sail for home, not yet, not till he beds down a faithful Trojan wife, payment in full for the groans and shocks of war. So this is our notion since, well, uh, since 700 BC uh, about the woman's place in a war. Uh, it's the, one of the early allusions to women as war booty, taken home as wives, captives, slaves. 3,000 years we have to move forward to now and to the changing consciousness, shifting consciousness. At the beginning of the last century, so 18, in the 1870s, just to give an idea, um, there's the first conference for, for women's rights, and this is in conjunction with the uh, Paris World Exposition. The delegates were from 12 countries, so we still have a long way to go. Uh, so over the next century, through the 1900s, we get the, uh, a new kind of growth of consciousness around women's roles in society, women get the vote, uh, women begin to write about um, their quest for uh, uh, equality. And uh, we get shifting ideas around women's bodies and around women's roles in war. So by the 1990s, uh, when the FOCHA investigation after the, um, after the war crimes um, tribunals are set up at the international criminal courts, we finally are in a place of consciousness where we can begin to think of rape and war as something quite other than we have for almost 3,000 years. This was one of the things that drew me to this story because when I, when I read about it, I thought, this is, this is revolutionary law that's happening. I didn't know much about it until I started talking to people who were working on the trials, and I asked myself, why don't you know about this? So that's one great truth. But there are other great truths that provide the context. And interestingly, again, 415 BC, so 300 years after Homer, you have Euripides, and he writes The Trojan Woman. The Trojan Woman tells the story of the women who were awaiting possession and rape by their Greek captors. So I found that also really, really interesting. So we can't think that there's only one line here. There's a couple of lines going on contiguously. And one of my favorite lines in that play is the women singing together, we need a new song. So I think this is, this is like the feminism that I, I have grown up with in this century. We need a new song. We need new words. We need new language. Virginia Woolf talks about, in her great anti-war book, The Three, Guine Three Guineas, she says, it's time to tell a new story. And I think that what happens is that in this trial at the center of Speak Silence, the voices of these women are creating the new song, the new story, and also new law. So my story began because this war kept erupting into my life. I was watching it over the course of you know, the years that it unfolded. And um, after I had watched it for the number of years and it, it, it finally um, was resolved, uh, then the war crimes trials started to interest me. A number of Canadians were working at the International Criminal Court, so I was hearing a little bit about it. Um, the, the 
UN uh, sponsored um, organizations like this have to be bilingual French English, which is quite interesting because all of these trials were transcribed in, into English and French, but not into the languages of the region, which is shocking. But uh, they, were all, they were all simultaneously translated, so there's a record in the oral accounts, but they were not written. Um, but we do have the English and French um, transcriptions. I went to The Hague. I met Ian Reid, a Canadian case manager, who showed me the courtrooms, he showed me the witness rooms, the evidence vaults, he, he, and he taught me how the, course, the cases were built. I interviewed the lead prosecutor on the trial. Um, she described to me, and this is a very interesting story, how the women witnesses were found. So, so many of the women who had been um, survivors from uh, the Bosnian War uh, did not go back to their home places because they couldn't. So they were settled around the world. And although there were only 16 women who testified, they interviewed several hundred women around the world to find out um, how to build the case. Because there were two parts to this. You had to build a case in which the perpetrators were all linked by the women, but you also had to find women who, you know, a decade after, the, after they had settled in new places and were raising families and learning new languages and, and working in new positions, these women were willing to come back to the court to testify. And this would be the first time that they would see their perpetrators in person. They'd be in the same room. So it took very, very special women who would agree to testify, who fit into the case, and who had the resilience, the emotional strength and resilience to want to do this. Then I went to Sarajevo because I was always not sure that I could write this book. I knew it was going to be difficult. I met Salem, who was at that point um, a tour guide officer, uh, uh, a tour guide, um, he ran a company. If you ever go to Sarajevo, he runs a company called Funky Sarajevo Tours, Breaking Prejudice. And I highly recommend his sons, his sons and, and he run it now. They had a wonderful, wonderful way of running this. They would take you to all the beautiful places in, you know, in the region and then slip in, slip in uh, visits to war crime sites. So I knew about Salem because he, had been a, he was a former soldier and I knew that he had been a driver for the UN investigators. So I phoned him and I said, you know, would you take me to some of the uh, to war crime sites? And he, he agreed to. And then Ian from The Hague um, uh, came as well. So this trip, in terms of the research, was absolutely fascinating. And I felt like I had two sets of information coming into me. So Salem was driving, and uh, he was always smoking and drinking uh, coffee and talking all at the same time while he was driving on these little mountain roads. But he knew and was happy to tell the stories of what happened on the ground to him as a soldier. And then in the back seat, I had Ian, who is a case manager at the courts, and he had you know his iPad full of all the stats. And you know, so many gone there, so many gone there, the battle here. So I had this kind of double optic of experience and all the information from the um, courts. Um, we had a very interesting trip. Salem, interestingly, had never been to Focha and uh, was at first a bit reluctant to explore with me the, this particular crime this particular war crime. At the end of the trip, he was, you know, he said, you know, we have not wanted to talk about these things. And um, uh, uh, this has been a very interesting week for me. Um, when I got back to, to Sarajevo, I went on my own to see Bakira Hasejic, and she runs the um, Women Victims of War NGO. And she, uh, was, she spent a generous day with me. She's been collecting testimony for um, ever since the war ended. And um, she uh, showed me the files. I, you know, in the offices, I saw just lines and lines of files of women who had given, told her their stories. And um, when I was leaving that day, I said to her, what can I do? What's important to you? And she said, I need money, because many of these women do not have enough money or family support. And I also need the world not to forget. 
And so this was actually after all the various meetings and interviews and stories that people had told me, uh, that was the moment when I thought, okay, I can, I can do this story. So I structured the novel as the trial was structured around three generations of Bosnian women, the grandmother, the mother, the daughter. And I wanted to mirror these three generations with three generations of Canadian women, so the narrator, her mother, and her daughter. I always feel that uh, we are not that separated from each other. When I step out into the world, whether it's out my front door in Toronto or onto a plane, it is the feeling of connectedness and well-being of others that is my own condition of well-being. And so in much the same way as I was watching the siege and, and wondering, you know, how could I not share this suffering in Speak Silence, uh, Adina and Goda feel connected with each other. And um, I wanted to read a short section where Gota is talking to her own mother on the Canadian side about the work that she's doing. Ma'am said, don't let them criticize you. Live your life. I wish I could give this fierceness to all young women. Ma'am showed me an enormous old family Bible. On the births, deaths, and marriage pages, someone had scrawled after my great-great-great-grandmother, Bridget Margaret Murray's name, Biddy. She was nine years old when she left Ireland during a famine. What did she do? Who took care of her? She had got pregnant by a soldier back from the Crimean War, and she died in childbirth at the age of 16. Hunger, child pregnancy, death. This tale of her life was written on a piece of vellum paper in fountain pen ink, tucked between the pages of Genesis by the same anonymous and neat hand that had written her nickname on our family tree. Ma'am said, our whole line comes from that girl. It's a complicated proposition to write about this kind of subject, but in fact, many women have courageously told their stories, and these stories have been transcribed by the courts for all time. When you're writing fiction, you're always looked, looking into the unlooked at places. You're always going into the unknown to see what is there and to find truth. I think that deep listening is actually one of the most dangerous things you can do. Because once you've heard something, you can't unhear it. Listening means wisdom. Listening means knowing. Listening means things that will delight you, but that may torment you. And after you listen, the next question is always, what do I do now? What should I do? Writing fiction is solitary, but it's not a closed life. It is exactly the opposite. A writer is always aware of the torment and the fleeting delight. And a writer is forged by this awareness. If a writer doesn't tell, who is going to tell? So in this last exchange between Goda and her mother, her mother urges her to be tough and loving at the same time. I was leaving for New York for three days, and I worried aloud to ma'am about leaving Biddy when I traveled for work and about feeling restless and needing to write about the things that I care about. Ma'am said, Gota, you've had it all. She was rarely impatient with me, and this stopped me. I said, I'm sorry. She said, work, Biddy's fine. I said, but I worry about being away. Ma'am asked, aren't I doing a good enough job? I didn't mean that. Biddy is doing what she's supposed to be doing. What is that? She's learning not to need you, but I still need you. Ma'am said, I know, I need you too. That is the strangeness of love. So my time's almost up, and I'd like to ask, end with a last passage about the women who came to testify in the courts, the women who built the case and who trust, created trust with the witnesses. The interesting thing about this trial was that it was almost exclusively run by women. The head prosecutor was from Germany. The head judge was a woman from Zambia. Prosecutors were from New York, Nepal, and Canada. The witness support workers and translators were, Holland, were from Holland and Croatia, and they were all women. So 
In this context, the women witnesses found the stamina and courage to speak their silence. I'll end with my tribute in the novel to them, and also a tribute to you and to all of our willingness to hear this truth. It was the women witnesses who won this case. They refused to back down. They refused to remain silent, and they refused to hide. They transmuted the word victim into hero. I am in awe of their strength. They spoke for themselves and for us. The whole world cannot stand trial, but we can all be responsible. A human is human through others. Thank you for that wonderful introduction to this book and more generally to your work, I'd say. Um, and it's really helpful, you know, in, in a sense what Kim just did was she went straight to the heart of an interview um, where you can actually talk about where does a book come from? Where, what's the context in which it was born, into which it was born? And so I'm going to take a couple steps backwards <clears throat> with you. Um, and, and then we'll come, come back to this and this particular project and, and basically how you, how you choose your pro projects. Uh, partly because, you know, we have people here who are at a very different place in their writing lives, either, you know, at a very early stage of it or, or not even yet at that early stage. But, but hearing and seeing what writers do and thinking, I know I'm in there somewhere and how, how do I get there? So when and how did you know that you wanted to write? And... Why was that your art of choice? I mean, I know that you're an accomplished musician as well, but why this particular genre? Uh, <clears throat> for me, um, I've always, I've always I, I was born knowing I needed to write. Yeah, it was just one of those things. But I had a wonderful grandfather who lived in a town not far from our, where we grew up. And he would write little, um, very little stories before I could read with pictures. And the pictures and the stories told me, it, it told me, you know, stories about myself because he, the, the character he invented was a little girl called Terry who happened to have brothers, like I did, who happened to have a dog named Bingo, like I did. And so uh, getting these stories in the mail before I could read uh, was my uh, real introduction to storytelling and it was my interface with the world. You're lucky you had that grandfather. Um, so, in your novels, you have tackled some, some events uh, uh, in, in the world's current history, really big ones, like this one that you just described, like the killing fields in Cambodia. And, you know, here in Israel, we know this phenomenon. As a matter of fact, Israeli writers are expected to write about the big issues or the big issue <clears throat> here in this country. And, and for decades, I'd say that if, if an Israeli writer didn't write about precisely those things, then there was sort of something wrong. Um, and so domestic issues, for example, got completely overlooked because they weren't part of the bigger picture. Or, you know what, let me put it in a different way. When my first, uh, when my first novel went to uh, a, a particular publishing house in America, they said, lovely book, but there's nothing exploding in here. And this is a story from Israel. I don't think we can, it's really for us. <clears throat> so you, though, um, as a Canadian, you took on issues that are not Canadian issues. There are certainly Canadian issues that you could have written about, but you've taken some big international issues on. So on the one hand, I want to say, why were you drawn to that? And then I want to stick you with a more difficult question. Who do you think you are taking on those issues? Thanks, Evan. <laughs> I'm glad you're my friend. <laughs> um, so I didn't start with the big international issues. My first books were actually really local. And uh, I think what happened was that time passed and I was, I had, I was writing from a p position of privilege. Uh, I had the privilege to travel. I was seeing things. Um, and it really is the question, what do you do once you know? 
And that was important to me. I was traveling, the, the, the first big international issue I took on, well, I mean, I took on, I used in a book uh, was um, the Cambodian genocide. And that, again, was not something I had expected to write about. But I was traveling in Cambodia with my husband. He was doing a medical mission there. And I had not expected or planned to write about Cambodia at all. But at the time we were there, it was illegal for people to talk about the genocide to foreigners. And yet, all through the time we were there, people would come up to you very quietly and say things like, I lost my whole family. And when I got back, I just kept feeling haunted by this because the, 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 what I was feeling in the people was what people said was, you know, does the world know? You know, do people know what happened here? And so um, that's when I thought, this, this is something that maybe I think I should do. And I dedicated that book to the woman in the market who first talked to me about her story. Because um, she will never know that that whisper in my ear was um, the thing that eventually allowed me to write a story about her country. Um, I think I don't feel that it's not my story. Uh, I think when I step out my front door, you know, we are connected in the world. Um, you know, 50% of my city of Toronto speaks a, a language other than English or French at home. Um, we step onto planes. This last couple of years, you know, I've been connected around the world by Zoom, as most of us have. And so I, I really don't feel that separate from the world. I feel that these are all of our stories. That's great. Fair enough. You got away with it, too. Um, I want to read you something, read to all of you something um, that's, uh, that's pretty fresh in the news. Um, and I'd love to hear your reaction to it. Um, this is, uh, well, it's called the Emergency World Congress of Writers. Can the power of the written word meaningfully bring about change in a world threatened by cascading crises and catastrophic events? This was the heart of the question put before 80 novelists, playwrights, essayists, poets, and journalists from 30 countries who were convened by PEN America for an Emergency World Congress of Writers at the United Nations on Friday the 13th of March. The war in Ukraine, the climate crisis, human rights atrocities around the globe, the killing of a Palestinian American journalist in the West Bank, failing democracies, rising disinformation, dehumanization spurred by technology, the denigration of facts and, and truth, racism, digital surveillance, the epidemic of distraction on our mobile phones, as CEO, Penn CEO Suzanne Nossel put it, and many other troubles some seemingly insurmountable, others overwhelming, were all topics up for discussion. The gathering which took place during PEN America's annual World Voices Festival was an echo of a 1939 meeting of 500 writers that PEN brought together at the World's Fair to address Europe's drift toward war and the rise of fascism. As a group, the writers seemed to unite around one point, that truth and powerful storytelling can influence and inspire people to act, even if they cannot stop evil altogether or reverse the world's woes. Salman Rushdie elevated this point eloquently, saying, a poem will not stop a bullet. A novel cannot defuse a bomb. But writers can still sing the truth and name the lies. We must work to overturn the false narratives of tyrants, populists, and fools by telling better stories than they do, stories within which people might actually want to live. And that's a beautiful, beautiful statement from Salman Rushdie. Um, I, I think I agree that uh, a poem doesn't stop a bullet, but I also think that without beauty, uh, we have only one truth in the world, the, the truth of the things that these writers listed. And the, the other truth is beauty, joy, the things that uh, literature um, helps us access. And I think maybe the reason why so many of us are gathered in a room tonight, um, because we believe that we can create beauty, a small stream into the great rivers and oceans. 
and that this is something that is and uh, th th that is constitutive of being human. My other sense of this is that when I go back to ancient Sumer, um, you know, this was a culture. The the, the Sumerians and the Akkadians uh, lived together in peace for a certain number of millennia. And then um, that relationship between the two cultures uh, became a culture of continuous war. And eventually the Akkadians overcame the Sumerians and um, uh, the, the, the Sumerian culture disappeared. But the Akkadians, even though they overcame the Sumerians because they wanted their trade routes and they wanted the power of their cities, they admired their writing so much that all of their tablets were bilingual. <laughs> and so you can see from, from the beginning of recorded history, humans have loved the written word. And even humans who can't stop themselves from conquering each other and creating wars with each other will hold on to beauty and the beautiful words that the Sumerians have. Sumerian is a language isolate, and if the Akkadians had not done those bilingual um, tablets, we would not have any access to translating them. And so this is also a gift to the future that those bilingual tablets gave us. That's great. Um, what, you, what you've just proven is that, you know, for all these thousands of years, this, the importance of the written word and the stories that we tell, you know, I, I, is, is, is so huge. And I, I know that um, I encountered somebody recently who said to me, oh, I'm, I'm a Bar Ilan graduate, graduate um, hum, in uh, engineering. And where are you? And I said, well, in, um, in the Department of uh, English Literature and Linguistics in, in Humanities. And he said, are there still humanities? And it was one of those rare, awful moments where I really had nothing to say. And when he saw, you know, how distressed I was, he said, well, no, I mean, I know that there's still humanities. Are there still students who come to study humanities? Which was even worse. I mean, as far as I was concerned, he was digging his grave and mine. And, um, and we hear things like this. And I think that's enough proof, um, you know, that without all of this, without these words, without this, um, this attempt to bring beauty and truth uh, to the world, um, where would we be? So you've shown us a little bit, a, a bit of a window into how uh, a project kind of comes to you and then what you do with it. But can you describe that maybe a little bit more? So you told us about Cambodia, and, and basically what happened was you made a trip there, and then it grabbed you. I mean, it grabbed you. And is it something similar, um, you know, with what happened with the, the, the war crimes trials? Um, and do you, I mean, there must have been other things. There have been things in the news or trips you've taken, other, other events that you've been witness to that haven't turned into a novel. So what's the difference between them? Why does this grab you and say, you have to write me, and something else doesn't? And if you could also just answer about the form, because you've chosen to do novels, even though you write in lots of different forms, you've turned those into novels. Um, I think you mentioned mystery a little bit earlier, and I think there is a, a very strong element of mystery. And because I know that there are so many writers here tonight, um, I, it, for me, it's about following energy. So it's an intuitive um, thing, and it's um, barely articul articulable. Uh, that, you know, uh, I'll be interested in lots of things, I'll start to write something, and it's where, you know, when you wake up in the morning, where that energy is, and that's, I try to follow that, I try to be faithful to that. So it is a bit of a mystery. Um, form, and again, because I know there's a lot of writers here, the form is never all that clear to me until I've written. And um, if it's of any reassurance, the first time, the, fir the first draft of the Cambodia book that I wrote, um, it was 400 pages. And it was rejected by every publisher, every agent, 
everyone everywhere. <laughs> and I thought I was kind of done at that point. I thought, why? Well, how can I go back? You know, you can't go back to the same publisher with the same book, even a rewritten version. And I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just stop. I'll, I'll teach. I'll do other things. And a week later, I was back at my desk. So it's what you can't not do. It's, uh, it's, and I think that that's what writers, how writers function. You know, you can't not write. And the next version was the version that was the true version. And I thought, well, nobody wants this book anyway. I'm going to write it exactly the way I want it. And I wrote it in the second person. I got rid of all the research. It, you know, it was down to 150 pages from the 400 pages. And that was the one that worked. So I, it's a, it was a huge lesson to me to follow um, where your energies lead you and to be true to them regardless of what people say. Because your reader always knows when you're telling the truth and when you're being, I talked about this a couple of days ago, being authentic to yourself. And we want to be with people, with writers, with books, where we feel that powerful authenticity. You called it the true version. So why didn't you write the true version the first time? Why did you send that 400-page manuscript out? Can you, do you know why? This is, this, is, this is not being courageous, right? I thought I had to get all the history down. I thought everybody would want to know every detail that I had researched, and that's not the case. People want to know the story. And, but I needed to do that work. I couldn't have written the short version without the long version, but I didn't need to think that it was part of the novel. Great. Thank you for that. Um, a reviewer once wrote that your novels have women who love men powerfully, but they love their independence more. Would you say that that's true about your writing? Um, I think so. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of any of the characters actually sort of stay married. <laughs> I don't think they do. I think they all are pretty independent. They, they, have, they have lovely relationships, but um, sort of like the Anana story, they're willing to sacrifice them for their, their freedom. You, um, okay, um, I, um, I, I've got so many more questions, but we're, we're getting close to the end, so... Um, uh, you mentioned in an earlier session that you are pitching a novel now. And uh, if, if you would explain what that term means to the audience. And um, what have you gone through to get to this point, um, that this, this novel you're pitching? Uh, so by pitching a novel, uh, I mean um, sending out queries to editors and agents and so on. And um, the context that Evan's talking about is we were talking about the difficulty of getting published. And we, it, during that workshop, we were talking about being published the first time. Um, but I was just sort of reminding the, uh, the, the people who are going through this that, for me at least, that process never stopped. Each new novel, I have to pitch again. And it's not a guaranteed yes. So um, that, that's what I was talking about. So this new novel that I'm working on, it's actually set in ancient Sumer. And um, <laughs> I have to really remind myself to remain true to myself and not put too much research into it. Um, and I'm getting resistance to this novel. So I need to not worry about that. Get the novel done, and then it will find a home, I hope. <laughs> so, so you're actually pitching it before you've finished the novel? That's kind of, that's part of the question. Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm, I, I am talking it over with people before I finished it, but I don't recommend doing that. I think that we should present our work finished and as, uh, as clean a draft as we can. Um, because often you only get one chance for editors and agents to read your work and you don't want them to read it if it's not exactly the work that you want. But you get very tempted to start, because you're so enthusiastic and you love the work so much that you want other people to love it with you. But it's, I think it's pretty important to wait until it's done. Yeah, well, just I just want to explain it even a little bit more. Pitching, pitching a project is much more common for nonfiction than it is for for a novel, because basically, if you can go to a publisher and say, um, "I want to write this uh, piece about 
Princess Di's secret lover, they'll say yes, you know, obviously. Um, and then, and they want to see maybe, uh, you know, a chapter or something to know that you, you can write good sentences. But um, they're basically falling in love with an idea. And with a novel, you can have a great idea for a novel, but if you, um, you can't carry that novel through, nobody knows what the arc of the novel is going to be and are you really going to achieve it, it's rare to find, or rarer to find um, novels that can be pitched and sold to publishing houses um, uh, than it is uh, for nonfiction. However, especially when you when you have a career, you're an established writer, and people know that you've gone through all those hoops. It's it's probably that much more possible. So somebody in Kim's position can say, you know, she's a known writer, and so if she comes to somebody with an idea, um, they'll be more likely to to listen. Um, I I do want to give some time. Um, to people, just a couple of minutes. If you have any questions for Kim, anything, uh, anything pressing that you want to know. Before we freeze under this Arctic air, it's amazing up here. I don't know how you're all experiencing it, but it feels like it's it's blowing straight from the North Pole on us. I'm I'm sorry I didn't put on my jacket actually. Um, anything you um, you want to ask? Marcella? Loud. I was kind of curious about whether any of the colleagues from The Hague or any of the women that were involved in the trials had an opportunity to read your, your novel and if, if you communicated with them about it. Yes, the colleagues from The Hague have actually become friends. Uh, I've traveled with them and they're just wonderful people. And um, have uh, read it, and I, I, all of these people by chance are interested in fiction, and so they're interested in how their lived experience got transmuted into fiction. Um, the women, no, um, and I did not interview the women because all of their testimony was on the record, and there is an issue of re-traumatization with retelling these stories. And since, the, since everything was available to me, I did not attempt, with the exception of Bakira Hasejic. And I've sent her the book, but her English is not um, you know, adequate to, to read. So someday if there's a translation, it would be interesting. If there are no questions, I'm going to ask two short ones. Or maybe not short, depends on your answers. Um, I recently discovered that my writing is the only place where I'm not only brutally honest, but the most completely selfish. I don't think of anyone but myself when I write. I'm not trying to please anyone, I'm not trying to impress anyone. Does writing hold that for you, or do you think of an audience when, uh, or a particular reader when you're writing? Uh, I think I'm in your camp, uh, I, and I think you. I think in my case, I have to be that way. Um, I have a family that I live with, and they don't necessarily want to know what's going on in my fictional head. Um, and um, uh, so there's, uh, some, you know, some families people read each other's novels and so on, but not, my family isn't like that, and it let it gives me a great freedom. Uh, so, so, so the things that are fiction remain in fiction, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally free that way. I don't have to worry about what people will think because we just say it's fiction. But it, this is a slightly different note, but I used to take my kids to literary readings when they were really little. And uh, at home we had a kind of use good language habit, and, but in a lot of the poetry at the time that they were hearing, there were bad words. Like, really bad words, and I remember my daughters coming up and saying, well, you know, the poets are saying those bad words, and I said, that's only okay in poetry. <laughs> it's not okay at the table. <laughs> um, my last question is, um, in, in, in your novel, The Disappeared, the protagonist, Anne, basically writes her story to save her C Cambodian lover, Sere, from having lived an unwitnessed life. 
you did me the great favor of reading my most recent manuscript, in which it could be said that a writer named Ellen wrote in order to save a young man named Yale from having lived an unwitnessed life. And I only made that connection really recently, that we're both kind of um, looking at that and giving those voices out. So do you think that's what we're doing all the time? Are we giving voices to the voiceless? And, and why them? Why do we cho choose those particular voices? Because there are a lot out there who don't have a voice. I think that we all need to be witnessed to. Um, you know, I can read you, you can read me. We don't, a book without a reader basically doesn't have a life. Um, and so I think that all of human communication is about witnessing to each other. And so I think in some ways that's the essence of storytelling. Um, and yes, important. That is a beautiful place to end. Thank you, Kim Eklund. Thank you to all of you for being here this evening.